This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 544, recorded on April 19th, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. I'm trying to figure out the weather, and my dashboard is showing me all these other places except for Ann Arbor. So my phone is telling me it's 43 degrees Fahrenheit, and my phone doesn't do Celsius that quickly. So eh, something Celsius. (laughs) Boy, we have 23 Celsius here. Nice day. Oh, yeah, no, it's not that nice. Nice day here. Overcast. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, guys. It's great to be here. Um, It is actually 76 uh, Fahrenheit or 25 Celsius here in Madison. Wow. It's a pretty nice day. Springtime. Definitely springtime. Uh, My uh, respiratory system can tell that it's springtime. Sorry. (laughs) Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody, uh, on this gender-balanced podcast. <laughs> um, uh, it is uh, 72 and sunny. That's 22 Celsius. It's a beautiful day. Uh, a little windy, but that's uh, pretty common here in Austin, Texas. It's dying down a little bit. It's going to be a beautiful weekend. Did you go rowing today? I did. I went out this morning. It was... Uh, especially good this morning because since it's Good Friday, the schools are out and a lot of people are off work. So I could go during what would ordinarily be rush hour and uh, zip to the uh, docks. (laughs) And I managed to get there. I pay close attention to the forecast. I managed to get there for a window of time before the uh, wind uh, sort of picked up and I had a gorgeous, gorgeous row. It was great. Uh, we have no traffic here today. Got in in less than an hour. Yeah, amazing. 38 miles. No traffic at the bridge. No traffic at the turnpike. Although by this time of year, I have to say, the roads are all messed up. They're all potholed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I have to remember where the big ones are. It's another <laughs> thing I have to do. Otherwise, I hit them in my car. It breaks the rims. And I've had like eight rims replaced Ooh. over the years because they crack and the air comes out. Yeah. Um, so I have tires that are called run flats. They have a big chunk of rubber in them and a little bit of air. So if you get a puncture, you can still drive. But the downside is when you hit a, a, a pothole, it transmits all the shock to the rim and it cracks. So I have to remember where every pothole is. Mm. And I, sometimes I forget and I hit these big ones. And if you, you know, most cars go over potholes, no big deal. But mine, it sounds like the thing is breaking and I inevitably curse it's a good thing I'm commuting alone. <laughs> yeah, the other downside is those run flats cost a gazillion dollars. I know. I just had one replaced. I had one. All of a sudden, my my flat light comes on. So I brought it in, and the guy says, okay, it's punctured, and they're both kind of uh, small treads, so you should replace them both. So I replaced them both. You know, it's like 300 dollars each. And then the next... That more the next day I pick them up. You know, I waited, then I drove to work, and then driving home that night, the the bloody light, the pressure light goes on again. Mm. Uh oh. So the next morning I bring it back, and he says, "Sorry, there's a crack. We missed it." <sighs> so I had to buy a rim. Uh. Oh wow. Oh man. <laughs> I'm sorry, everyone. Sorry, yeah. we had to tell you that. Oh. Well, and now I can tell you that. Uh, <laughs> It's six degrees Celsius here. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty chilly. So for those of you who don't like hearing about the weather or tires, sorry. <laughs> it's uh, pretty chilly. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, just on Twitter, we were talking about how uh, TWIV is a journal club. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, mm-hmm. it is, really, because um, we do papers. We have a couple of people talking about papers. And, you know, that's what a journal club is. You may have more people. We may have one person kind of leading it, but that's what we do. So if you can't have a journal club where you are, you can just listen to us. And and a lot of you do. I know that. 
and we appreciate it. But if you really like what we do, consider supporting us. We could use your financial support. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute, and there are ways where you could, for example, give us $1 a month. And that gives you, let's see, four twivs, two twims, two twips, one immune, and one twivo. That is got to be one of the best bargains around. I'll say. A yeah. buck for all those shows. And um, we try and uh, be accurate. And uh, when sometimes we don't know answers, people tell us. So overall, it's a good buy. So check it out, microbe.tv slash contribute. So today we have two papers for our TWIV Journal Club. Uh, this first one is published in Nature Medicine. It's called The Repertoire of Maternal Antiviral Antibodies in Human Newborns. And the, uh, let's see, first author is Christian Pou, and the last author is Petter Broden. And this comes from the Karolinska Institute, which is over in Stockholm, Sweden. And, and the second author is a co-first author, and I know you wanted to not have to try and pronounce that one, but I can do it. Go it ahead. It be go very ahead. good. Go <laughs> Diodone. Kulikimfura. Yeah. Giudone. I wonder where that's from. Somewhere in Africa, maybe. I'm looking it up. Probably, right now. yeah. Probably. Oh, that's a tough one. Yeah. The reason I picked this paper is because this week on Immune, we talked about a potential herpes simplex virus vaccine for newborns where you would immunize the mother, the pregnant mother, and the antibodies would cross the placenta and protect the newborn. And they showed in mice in this paper we did that that works. So this caught my eye because it is all about maternal antiviral antibodies that end up in, in newborn serum. And as everyone knows, uh, as you are developing in utero, you do not have uh, yet a functional immune system. So you, don't have, you can't make your own antibodies. It doesn't happen until about 15 weeks after you were born. So in meanwhile, your mother very kindly gives you her repertoire of antibodies, the IgG, are transferred across the placenta to the uh, for the fetus. Then when you're born, you have your mother's experience in infections in terms of uh, antibodies. And they protect you until you can make your own. It's, it's a great uh, example of altruism. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And in fact, the immune podcast, I, the title I thought of was Mom's the Word. Oh. Ooh. Because Good. she is, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's great. And so uh, this, uh, <laughs> you know, this is stuff that I suppose I should know, but still it, it, it came as a, uh, a nice sort of surprise to me. Like I didn't realize, I guess it makes sense, but I didn't realize that you've got none of your own antibodies at birth. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize it takes so long. You know, your, yeah. your own, your own antibody production doesn't take over until 15 weeks after birth. And by the way, for the crowd out there who might be interested in vaccine scheduling and strategies, that's important. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Can interfere. Yeah, for sure. And that's one of the reasons to do this study is to know exactly what's there because we don't know exactly what is in uh, serum that's transferred from mother to infant and now we have the technology to do it and so this paper asks what is the repertoire of uh, maternal and newborn igg uh did you also talk about i was away there for a minute the um <laughs> do you have a senior moment uh, no i was looking up the origin of the name of the second author What'd and you? the closest i can get is somebody in rwanda mm -hmm. okay um so uh did you talk about uh, the difference between preterm and full term no. babies? No. Not yet. Okay. So the the part of the introduction here too is that the literature says that uh, preterm uh, babies have at least a lower concentration of antibodies and maybe not the same repertoire. Right. Uh, and so they wanted to investigate that as well, and that's really important as well because you may, uh, in terms of you know, exposure to pathogens or vaccines or whatever, you may, uh, depending on the results of this, regard a preterm child differently than a full-term child. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. 
So the, the technique they use is veer scan, which we discussed on TWIV and uh, what was it called? Where is it? Epitope, oh, uh, TWIV 342. Uh, uh, public Epitope number one. Right. That's a good title. It's uh, TWIV 342, long time ago. And of and, course, I'd forgotten completely that we discussed it. <laughs> re-educated of course, of myself. Of course, of course. It's a pretty cool technology where they, what they did, they established this technology where they take the genomes of 1,276 viral strains from 206 species that are known to infect human cells. And then they take the, uh, the coding region and they make 56 amino acid long linear peptides that overlap, half of them overlap with the next one. And then they encode these into bacteriophages so that they are presented on the bacteriophage capsid. Right. Page T7, mm-hmm. my old buddy. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, is he is it, is it your buddy too? Would you would it consider you its buddy? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> There's no question about it. Okay. No, we are we are such fast friends. Because you can imagine that if the experiments did not go well, one would not think it's your buddy, right? Uh, you know, you know, friends, friendships okay. have their ups okay. and downs. So the the peptide is on the capsid. So then the idea would be you mix. Then you have a library of phages representing all these epitopes. And you would mix serum with these phages. The uh, you can then uh, bring down the complexes. They capture them with magnetic beads. <laughs> you sequence the phage genome, and you say, "Aha! This is the epitope that has been brought down by antibodies in this serum." Amazing! It's great. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> of course, it's limited to what you put in it. Of course, you know these two hundred and six species known to infect human cells, but it's a good start. And the, and the the coverage is the entire coding capacity of all of those right. uh, human species. And they, they say the one that's in the existing library, the one missing is uh, Zika. Hmm. I guess right. uh, Zika post-dated yes. their, their, that's uh, right. the, their uh, creation of this library. Yeah, so public epitope number one was recorded in 20, June 2015. <clears throat> So, you know, it came out, it was probably submitted a year earlier. So, yeah, it would yeah. have been time for yep. Zika. I, re- I remember uh, talking about this technique the in a class that I taught in 2015. And at the very end of that semester, we talked about this curious new virus, Zika, that there seemed to be a number of cases of in Brazil. And we wondered if anything might happen with it. This, the, the samples they used were from the Karolinska in, uh, University Hospital, and they have 78 mother-child dyads. And this is from another study, so they were able to use that. So they have serum um, from the mothers and then the child cord blood, so that's at birth, and then 1, 4, and 12 weeks after birth. So I would guess even if they had Zika in the, um, <clears throat> on the panel, they wouldn't get much from this cohort. Unlikely, being in Sweden and and not much Zika up there. So they put this through the uh, the Veer scan, and uh, they uh, found the most frequently targeted viruses in parents. Um, wait, sorry, that's from another study. So they have of this cohort. I have to tell you more about the cohort: thirty-two extremely preterm children who were born before thirty weeks gestation. 46 term children, that's greater than 37 weeks. And they use the VIR scan to, to uh, look at the maternal and the ch- child's antibody. Well, you started to say what they found in the parents. And uh, there was a previous study, but what they found for the parents in this study was similar. So in the parents, they found the highest to be CMV, cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, herpes simplex virus 1, and rhinovirus A. Hmm. It's very interesting. Rhinovirus. Mm-hmm. We're all DNA viruses except for rhinovirus, common mm-hmm. infection. So that, yeah, that was another study that had been done, and they and, and theirs agreed with the most frequently targeted viruses. Okay. And actually, three of <clears throat> three of them are herpes virus. Cytomegalovirus yeah, is right. herpes that's virus. Right. Epstein Barr virus is a herpes virus, and of course, herpes simplex virus is a herpes virus. And I. You know, I wonder whether that has to do with the fact that these viruses establish latency so that they can 
uh, hang around. Probably. I, yeah, probably. I, I, I don't really know because we're looking at antibodies, but that's, that's, that's what comes to mind. Yeah, and lately, and lately infected people, the, there are antibodies. And that's part of the reason why the, the herpes paper, the work in the herpes paper I mentioned earlier was done, because mothers who are latently infected, their, their babies typically don't have neonatal herpes because they pass antibodies to them. Mm. Whereas the mothers who are infected more recently, new infection, they don't have antibodies to pass on, and they pass on the virus instead, and that's a problem. So... When you're latently, in, in fact, they establish latent infections in mice, and they show that you have antibodies, as such. So, so yes, you get them latent infections. So, the preterm and the term children have similar ap- repertoires of maternal IgG, irrespective of gestational age at at birth. No segregation between the two, and they say this was unexpected because supposedly IgG transfer happens mostly during the final trimester. So, if you're preterm, you wouldn't be protected. But even their most extreme preterm had the antiviral repertoire comparable to the term children. So I guess the idea that third trimester is is not right, right? I guess right. not. Right. Not but, according to this. But <laughs> I guess I want to make the, the distinction of um, quality and quantity. So the repertoire seems to be the same, but they're going to show that um, there's a there's a bit less of it in the preterm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, all right. So, uh, the repertoire, is, as Kathy said, is um, the most frequently targeted viruses are adenovirus C, uh, cytomegalovirus, Epstein Barr virus, herpes simplex one, and rhinovirus A. So the the adeno C didn't show up in that list that you read, Kathy. I know. I noticed that too. It wasn't in the adults, but it was in the children. Interesting. All right. So, what about epitopes? So that those are the viruses. So, but we can drill down and look at epitopes. Epitopes being the portion of a protein, a small portion of a protein that an antibody will actually bind to. You have a whole protein, but some of it's buried, some of it's more obvious, and antibodies will bind to the mm-hmm. some of the most mm-hmm. prominent so, prominent parts, a bit of a protein. And of course, some epitopes are immunodominant. They Antibodies to those are very common and others are less so. So they wanted to see what do we find. And so um, one thing is that the bigger the viral genome, the more epitopes you find, which kind of makes sense. There's more coding region. Uh, and huh? then they looked to see, well, you can, there's all this data are in this lovely picture. So you could look at it. But what they, they looked at respiratory syncytial virus because this is an important pathogen that hits very young babies. And so it's important that mothers pass on antibodies to protect them. And this, um, they find an immunodominant epitope in a specific region of the viral glycoprotein. And uh, these antibodies against this were often found in mothers and uh, in the offspring. Mm-hmm. Patterns look mm-hmm. very similar. Between, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So, so Brianne, what makes for immunodominance in an epitope? Is it just the e- exposure on the outside of a protein, or is there more to it than that? Uh, there's a quite a bit more to it than that. Um, the two biggest things have to do with the amount of that epitope that's made. So, is it a protein that's made in many copies um, and can turn on many? cells to make antibodies, or is it a protein that's present in few copies, but also the strength of the binding affinity for the antibody and how that leads to signaling in the cell. And that's just that the strength of binding would just be a property of the sequence or the structure? Exactly. That That's something that um, people sort of end up just figuring out with experimentation. They haven't mm-hmm. really come up with a way to predict which epitopes okay. would be immunodominant based on that. Okay. They mapped 10,362 epitopes and said, which protein do they come from? And uh, for the 44 most commonly targeted viruses, they defined the immunodominant epitopes, which would be in at least half of the seropositive children. And they found differences in the presence of these peptides among different viruses, like rhinoviruses and a and B have multiple epitopes, over 75% of the children, while flu A and B have no such immunodominant epitopes. It's quite interesting. 
Mm-hmm. And they speculate about why might that be. You know, the shifts in influenza viruses between season may, may, seasons may be part of it. Cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, enteroviruses, similar um, immunodominant epitopes. And pre, again, preterm and, and term, these frequencies of these ep- immunodominant epitopes were comparable. So they think, again, the IgG transfer happens earlier than we think. At least in terms of the diversity, if not in terms of the actual amount of yeah. IgG transfer. Yeah, you can imagine it's, it's squeezing through. Maybe it's there's less time for the preterms for that to happen, but it's going to be overall representation of everything, just less. Yeah, Exactly. RS virus, again, multiple RS virus epitopes in over half uh, of the children, mostly involving the glycoprotein. <clears throat> and that's, of course... Um, going to be important for attachment and infectivity. And for other viruses, only one immunodominant epitope, like parainfluenza viruses, one immunodominant epitope. Um, And then they compared antibodies, the levels among preterm and term children, and they do this by an ELISA assay, so they can quantify uh, the levels of IgG to these uh, epitopes and um, overall, uh, the the main determinant of IgG concentration in newborns is <laughs> the concentration in the mother, which they showed for a couple of viruses. However, RS virus antibody concentration were not well explained by maternal levels. Gestational age was a influencing factor for that one. So maybe different antibodies have different uh, rules for transfer across the placenta. And so they said we need to look at this a little bit more. Right. Another issue is lifespan of maternal antibodies, right? The half-life, how long they last in the serum. That would determine how it gets into the fetal circulation. Um, And that is important for learning when to give antibodies, right? Um, IgG were generally higher in term versus preterm children, but the rates of decay were comparable. So that would cause you to have longer half-lives and uh, overall maternal IgG duration in term children. Are these functional antibodies? So they do some uh, neutralization assays. They use respiratory syncytial virus and looked at the neutralization of uh, the sera from the moms and the children. And the cord blood samples uh, differ significantly uh, in their ability to neutralize uh, virus and culture depending on when. Yeah, the cord blood is the earliest one. And then later samples, the week one and week 12, uh, had better neutralizing capacity. Yeah, that and the um, information about uh, different uh, types of antibodies being transferred um, somewhat differently, like you had talked about with the previous figure, yeah. that the RS virus uh was more related to gestational age than the others is a little bit surprising. Um, The um, mechanism that allows the antibodies to move, the receptor that moves the antibodies, shouldn't um, be able to distinguish things like antibody affinity or um, which epitope the antibody is binding. And so the fact that these types of things differ uh, is a bit surprising. So it would be interesting to know why. Exactly. Neutralizing capacity of maternal IgG against RS is the same for preterm and term children overall. But then there were these time point differences. Extremely preterm children are are just as well protected by maternal antibodies compar- compared to term. But um, we do know that uh, preterm children have higher mortality caused by RS virus. But it's not because they're not getting uh, antibodies from the mom, maybe because they get lower concentrations, turns over quicker, and that's part of the issue. Sure. So that is uh, the story. It's it's a nice description of what antibodies are transferred uh, to the to the uh, infants, and you can use that to guide vaccine distribution. Uh, and I think uh, since we see that you know RS virus antibodies are clearly transferred. Um, you could, and this is something we talked about on the TWIV at Nova Scotia last year. You can uh, imagine immunizing mothers to protect the babies uh, from RS virus infection because 
you know, they get targeted in the first six weeks of life, and that's hard to vaccinate at that time. Mm -hmm. That's sort of what they're trying to do with pertussis vaccination, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, is give pertussis to pregnant mothers to protect the babies for the same reason. So So RS virus and um, herpes viruses that you get very early on, viruses that are moving transplacentally as well, you can immunize the mother to protect uh, the newborn from those. Absolutely. So I have a I have a, a question and a comment. Um, so I I wonder about the sensitivity of this. I was surprised that uh, in surveying the mothers and the fathers, they saw on the order of five to ten viruses targeted, up to twenty in some. I would have I somehow expected a lot more, given mm-hmm. the experience in a in, in an adult. And then if I look specifically. For example, at measles, um, you know, you get a, they score these things kind of by a thing called VIR score, which I think is uh, a measure of how frequently they uh, get a hit from one of these uh, individuals. And measles does show up, but it's uh, uh, not very abundant. I would have expected, you know, measles antibodies to be in uh, everybody. Does this but maybe I'm thinking about this wrong. Uh, um, uh, maybe <clears throat> you have a, a memory of uh, your measles infection uh, that would be reflected in a very low serum concentration of antibody, enough so that you can uh, uh, get a good uh, immune protection, uh, but not enough to show up in VIR scan. Does anybody have a perspective on this? Well, I don't think you need to have such a high serum level because you're going to have a pretty quick memory response when you get exactly. infected, right? That's what right. I'm thinking. Right. You probably have a lot of cells that are ready to make that memory response. You don't have to have them actually making the antibody proteins. Okay. So that gets back to your comment, Rich, about these herpes viruses that you know are, are latent or persistent, that you know maybe there's this constant low level of antibody production, and that that's what's you know, that's how that can get transferred. Yeah, I'm thinking there's a constant low-level reactivation of those viruses from their right. latent state right. that's constantly tweaking the... I mean, the immune system is probably at work all the time keeping those guys tamped down. Right. Whereas yes. the others that we're talking about are, are acute infections that come and go, and as long as you have some mm-hmm. vague memory of what happened, yeah. you're okay. Yeah. So if you look at the highest, the most common are the herpes viruses, but then in there are the rhinos, which we get infected with all the time. Yes, right. And uh, some enteroviruses, RS, uh, influenza viruses, you know, all common. And then this this figure, as you move up on the y-axis, that's fewer and fewer positives. And there you have uh, other herpes virus, cow, <laughs> some cowpox virus there. Uh, other adenoviruses, parvoviruses, Hep B, and the uh, sixth one from the top. One, two, three, four. Tarketano. Yep, that's a cool <laughs> little single-stranded <laughs> DNA virus. Um, I also noticed the uh, top one is Aichi virus, which is a picornavirus. So the uh, those are less rare infections. So that and there's also at this papain no yeah right papain uh, herpes herpes which is a baboon herpes yeah i noticed uh macacine herpes virus yeah. uh, which i would assume is the macaque herpes virus so remember these yeah. these peptides are included in the library because the viruses infect human cells so maybe they also infect people yeah, but the macacine is the virus that's a BSL-4 virus. It's really nasty in oh, people. Yes, okay. so, yes, it is. So maybe it's yeah. cross-reactivity, you think? Yeah. Perhaps. Mm-hmm. Well, I noticed a couple of hits for vaccinia and cowpox, and I figured yeah. those are uh, people who had, you know, smallpox vaccinations, maybe. Maybe. Would they cross-react? I yeah, I guess they would. Co- yeah, co- cowpox and vaccinia, yeah. uh, vaccinia would cross-react, yeah. It's all the Jenner story, yep. So uh, the other uh, point I wanted to reemphasize, I don't think this kind of stuff can be uh, reemphasized too often, is the, uh, the uh, point about scheduling vaccines. Um, so the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine is, because this is, this is something that comes up in the vaccine, I don't even want to call it a debate that gives it too much credit. Vaccine hesitancy. 
Vaccine hesitancy, right. Vaccine. Do we say of, vaccine idiocy? <laughs> <laughs> one of the arguments that comes up all the time is that uh, the the scheduling is is crazy and we want to reschedule the vaccines. And my the point I want to make is that the scheduling is very well thought out. Um, and it's uh, in, in the case of the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, uh, they suggest the first dose between 12 and 15 months of age. Uh, and a second dose at four to uh, six years uh, of age. And this is because uh, you're born with your maternal antibodies against these two, two reasons. You're born with maternal antibodies against these, plus your, uh, as a child, your own immune system is not ready to mount an immune response uh, against appropriately against the vaccine. So you have to wait uh, the 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 maternal response, even if you gave a vaccine, could uh, compromise the effectiveness of the vaccine because of the maternal antibodies. So you have to wait until they wane, and wait until your own capability for an immune response uh, turns on, hmm. and that's going to be somewhere after 15 weeks. I don't know quite how they come up with uh, 12 to 15 months. I think that probably guarantees that yeah, the maternal yeah. immunity <laughs> is gone. There are some uh, vaccines that are given earlier than that. Yeah, Hep B is given at birth, 24 hours within birth. I'm looking at this. Yeah, so th this brings wow. up even my immunologist colleague who is teaching in the virology class said, I don't understand this. If, you know, that they immunize, if the, if the particularly if the mom is HPV positive, hepatitis B positive, but basically they kind of do it for everybody, immunize them right after birth. Yeah, it's weird. But if yeah, this is so true... How is well, how are they making an immune response? I don't know. I don't know about that one. And then they give another booster at one to two months after the first dose. So by then maybe you can have some waning of. Uh, so, but you can make, babies can make IgG at fifteen weeks, right? Well, right. they can make some IgM earlier. Okay. Um, and so it may be about trying to get an early IgM response, even mm -hmm. if the IgM isn't quite as effective. Okay. okay. And it, there's there's two other issues with uh, hepatitis B. Getting the kids early, as early as possible, as early as is practical, is really important because if you get hepatitis B as an infant, the probability that you'll go on to develop a chronic infection with uh, all sorts of nasty outcomes, including uh, cirrhosis and uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, is much, much higher. So if you can get kids uh, and when they're really at high risk at a very early age, um, you're you're better off. And also, uh, I they uh, uh, I remember reading that they experimented with selecting out of the population people who might be at risk because of this HBV status of the mothers. And in the end, the most effective way to do this was just to get everybody. Mm. Just vaccinate everybody, mm. and it doesn't do any harm. It's just a protein, okay? And uh, you ensure that you get complete coverage of anybody. I remember hearing that, too. Yeah, irrespective of our uh, questions, this has been shown to work, and that the schedule is based on the fact that it works. Yeah. And, you know, it's been... It's been uh, moved around over the years, and so if they give uh, IPV in month four, I think I saw IPV in, at four months of age. We know it works. Of course, you need boosters as well, but uh, it's all it's all sorted out. It's not random. It's carefully considered. Well, as, actually, uh, you know, it, it, th this raises an interesting point because we throw around these uh, generalities about the. Uh, maturation of the newborn's uh, immune system uh, and their immune uh, competence. And yet this paper itself already, uh, you know, uh, says that the our unders, what we thought was a correct understanding of maternal transfer to newborns was inaccurate. Maybe some of our other uh, understanding of the maturation of uh, a newborn's immune system isn't entirely accurate as well. And and our uh, uh, experience with vaccines that work when we're saying, well, you know, maybe, you know, it doesn't seem like they should, says that, you know, there's more to learn. I'm sure. And, you know, it's not 
like everyone is exactly the same. There's always a variation, right? Right. But let's say you wanted to do a definitive experiment and ask, when do kids start making IgG, right? So, you know, you get a cohort, like this cohort would be a good one, but how do you distinguish between the child's IgG and the mother's? Right, that's that would be really challenging. If you um, just measure if you just measure total IgG, you could see it slowly decline and then at some point start to go up and you know that would be a rough indication of when the child is making antibodies, but it wouldn't be the exact point, right? No, Brian, does the, does the does the mother uh well, you, could you look at IgM? Um, the two main isotypes that are transferred are IgG and IgA. IgG is the only isotype that can cross the placenta, um, and IgA uh, is transmitted in breast milk. Um, but you could look at IgM to see when the newborn is making their own, since that isn't transferred. Um, we think that right. one's a little earlier. Okay, and and IgM is a uh, is it correct to say that in all cases that's a precursor to IgG? If you're going to get ultimately an IgG response, you start off by making IgM? The first response to any of your antigens is always an IgM response. Okay. So if you looked at uh, the development of an IgM response in a child as it was uh, developing, you could be reasonably confident you were looking at the, the child's uh, immune response, right? An IgM would tell you it was the child's immune response, yes. All right. Mm. Let's yeah. write a grant. You could do that, yeah. <laughs> I would I would knock in GFP into the uh, fetal uh, IgG <laughs> locus. Mm -hmm. Oh, we can't mm -hmm. do that. We can't mm, do that. Yeah. <laughs> and if you did it in mice, of course, mice lie, and they're right. different from, anim from uh, humans. Anyway, so interesting things. Um, okay, that is a cool. I don't know if it's uh, open access. Does anyone know? I don't think so. Probably not. Nature I don't Medicine. Think so. I don't think so. You want to cash in, but it's a cool study. I hope we summarized it sufficiently. Uh, now we have a paper which is uh, published in Cell Host and Microbe, and it is a, a virus we don't talk about very often, and so it's adenovirus. And this is this is up Kathy's alley. <laughs> Actually, we all love adenoviruses. But yeah. how, when's the last adeno paper we did on Twiv? Does anyone know? Yeah, mm. <laughs> it's got to be a long what? time. I don't know, but uh, you had Urs Graber on. I'm gonna. I was gonna refer to that. Oh, that's he right. He did a really good job. Yeah, yeah. Of talking about adenovirus entry. Yeah. Well, yeah. I was just gonna so say this paper is also open access. It is open yeah, access. It is yes. open access, oh, good. and the first one was not. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Tathy, since it's adenovirus, uh, you, you may lead the discussion. Okay. <laughs> so the title is Complement C4. Prevents viral infection through capsid inactivation. And the first author is Maria Botterman, and the senior author is Leo James. And they are at the MRC in Cambridge. And then there's uh, collaborators from University of Oslo, Oslo University Hospital, uh, so uh, England and Norway for this. Do you know any of these uh, investigators, Kathy? No, I have... Uh, done email correspondence with Leo James, but have never met him. Uh, I don't think any of them have come to the international adenovirus meeting, um, which is a shame because then we get to know them. But uh, yeah, so so what's interesting about this, so those of you who already heard the word compliment are, and might be kind of choking up, uh, getting <laughs> nervous, um, <laughs> what I want to say is that um, the idea of the compliment cascade tends to intimidate those of us who only encounter it occasionally, either in our research or in teaching. You can and, see me raising my <laughs> hand on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. And so um, I'm going to try and uh, uh, reassure you that it's not we, we don't have to get too complicated with that. And if you do want more information, the Immune 7 podcast uh, covered compliment nicely. And so the big picture for this is that I think there's two main things to take home. One is that there are antibody-mediated actions that counteract viruses, but they take place inside the cell. So until a previous paper from Leo James' work uh, group on TRIM21, which we'll talk more about, I don't, I don't think I ever contemplated the fact that 
antibodies had anything to do once, you know, once you're talking about inside the cell. And uh, then the second thing is that when you think about complement, usually you think about it being an innate response, although it can be adaptive or intrinsic, depending on how you define intrinsic and innate, but definitely um, it involves antibodies in some of the uh, forms. You think of it as being antibacterial, anti-infected cell, or anti-enveloped virus. And here, if you remember, adenovirus is a double-stranded DNA virus, medium-sized genome, but it doesn't have an envelope. And so the fact that complement might be involved is kind of unusual. And then again, this idea that it's something taking place inside the cell. So the reason I think people get nervous is that there are a whole bunch of proteins, there's a whole bunch of cascades, this protein cleaves, and then that protein cleaves, and uh, so forth and so on. And there's three different types of pathways, the classical, the alternative, and the lectin pathway. And really, none of that matters for us today. In this paper, we're mostly talking about the classical paper, and that's where a complement complex called C1 uh, binds to an antigen antibody complex. So it is kind of interfacing with the adaptive immune response because there's antibodies involved. And so, and then just in general, I kind of alluded to the things that complement can result in with respect to microbes and so forth. You can get lysis of foreign cells or envelope viruses by making a pore. You can activate inflammation you can opsonize, and that means binding one of these complement proteins onto the microbe that then makes it get phagocytosed by uh, one of the key phagocytic cells like macrophages or neutrophils, something like that, and then they can destroy it. And then a fourth one is that you can solubilize immune complexes, antigen antibody complexes. So, Can, can I add two things? Yes, yes, please. Um, so, uh, when I was first taught about the term opsonization, um, my professor used uh, a little way of thinking about it that really helped me a lot. Um, so he talked about opsonization as sort of being like butter. Um, it's a coating that you put on something to make it more likely to get eaten. <laughs> Um, <laughs> or, uh, so you're basically coating the pathogen with something, in this case, complement, in order to make it more likely to get phagocytosed. Excellent. Brienne, I can't imagine you would need such help on learning anything. <laughs> well, I will tell you that if you look at my first ever immunology exam, I was asked to define opsonization, and I wrote that it was the butter one, because <laughs> I couldn't remember the rest of the definition. <laughs> the butter one. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. I like that. Did you get um, credit? I did not, um, but I still tell my students about butter to this day, uh, and they write me funny jokes about it. Um the other thing remind yeah. me to tell you a story when we're done with this paper. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I um, have one too. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that I often think about when I think about complement is that there are three different ways to start complement, like Kathy described, the alternative, the classical, and the lectin pathway. And then they all come together. Yes. Um, and then there are a few different ways that Kathy mentioned that complement can get rid of a microbe. And those are all sort of at the bottom after the three pathways have come together. And so I often teach my students, well, you just have to know if this protein is at the top part or at the bottom part. Mm. Um, and this paper is kind of interesting because one of the proteins from the top is going to actually do something about a pathogen, which we usually think of as being at the bottom. Mm. Now you can't tell your students that anymore now. I know. This is, <laughs> it's, it's ruining my whole lecture. <laughs> Okay, so what I want to do next is have everybody imagine that you're standing up um, and you have your feet together and your arms are out in a Y shape. And now you are an antibody. And your legs pretty much are what are going to interact with what we call the FC receptor, or they're the, they're the FC portion of the antibody. And then your arms are what are reacting with the antigen. So that's what's providing the specificity. And so in this paper, they use a wild-type antibody that is uh, a monoclonal antibody. So it's just a very specific uh, antibody to the adenovirus 5 coat protein. And I'll try and just – we'll try and call that wild-type antibody. And then 
through the magic of recombinant DNA, they made mutant forms of this antibody. And in one of them, they mutated amino acids 234 to 235, which I'm thinking might be somewhere around your thighs, uh, but they're still <laughs> in that FC receptor part, okay? Because if uh, it was pretty hard to find the numbering and the N and the C termini on antibody pictures, but I think the heavy chain is about, let's call it 500 amino acids. So amino acids 234 and 235. And they mutated both of these and they call this antibody LALA, L-A-L-A. <laughs> and this uh, mutation prevents the antibody from binding to the FC receptor. So remember I told you that your thighs are, are the FC portion and they would bind to the FC receptor. But if you have this mutation, that doesn't happen. And then... Uh, they use another mutant antibody that's maybe down around your shins. It's uh, P329A. And this is particularly important and interesting because this part of the antibody interacts with C1Q, a, a particular part of that C1 complex uh, in the complement pathway. And so if you mutate that, then uh, that antibody can't interact with complement. And then the other thing that they use is uh, this TRIM21, which I said Leo James Lab identified for us uh, as being, it's an FC receptor that can detect antibody-bound viruses like adenoviruses. And it does this when the adenoviruses have escaped the endosome and are now in the cytosol. So this TRIM21 host factor is an FC receptor that binds to the antibodies in their thigh or leg part, and, but only when they've entered the cytosol. And it's, uh, it doesn't require very many antibodies for it to uh, bind and act. So adenovirus ordinarily gets in, right, by binding at the cell surface and then mm -hmm. taken up in an endosome mm -hmm. and then gets... Uh, through a series of processes uh, involving some cleavages and disassembly of the capsid gets out of the endosome right. and into the cytoplasm. Right. And if it came in with antibody on it, then when it's escaping the endosome, TRIM21 could find it. Exactly. Right? Okay. Exactly. And what we're going to learn about today is that before that even happens, this complement uh, antiviral mechanism can act sort of at that endosome escape part of the pathway. Okay. So, and uh, just as another aside, uh, Vincent wrote a nice virology blog about TRIM21 back in 2010. So it was uh, November 11th, 2010, 11, 11, 10. You can go back and check that out. Oh, I was looking for that. I couldn't find it. Thank you. <laughs> I just Googled TWIV TRIM21. Huh. <laughs> That's how I found it. So, okay. Did, did you mention that one part of complement is that the protein, the complement proteins become attached to other things? Oh, no, um, I didn't. So you can elaborate on that. Um, so as this different uh, complement cascade is going forward, a big part of it is that the complement proteins, starting with uh, one called C4, um, will become covalently attached to the microbe, um, in, perhaps in this case, the virus. Um, and so that also was really helpful to me in terms of thinking about the fact that when this pathway starts, the virus may have these complement proteins becoming covalently attached. Right. Okay, so just a couple other things they're going to use, wild-type HeLa cells, and then they're going to use some HeLa cells that lack this TRIM21 protein. And then they use normal human serum. And most of the time when I think they're using it, it's just as a source of complement. Yeah. And then occasionally, although it's not really clear where, they're using it as a source of polyclonal anti-adenovirus antibodies. But I think that's just once, and it's not really important for the main. So just when, it, when they're using the normal human serum, that's a way of bringing complement into the equation or picture or whatever. And then sometimes they also have purified complement proteins C1 and C4. So uh, they start out, and I think the first couple figures are the most complicated. So 
uh, try, try to simplify those as best I can. They start out with this wild type antibody that can neutralize adenovirus. And they look at this neutralization, the standard way that we do virus neutralizing antibody assays. They incubate the virus with the antibody, and then they add it to the cells, and they measure how much virus they get out. And if the antibody is neutralizing, they should get reduced virus yield relative to if there were an uh, irrelevant antibody provided, for example. And then sometimes in their assays, they also include this normal human serum. So they w incubate the antibody plus a virus, and then they add in the serum for 30 minutes, which provides the complement. And then they add that to the cells. And when they do that in cells that are knocked out for this TRIM21 protein, they find that the ability to neutralize the adenovirus infection is reduced. And they find this whether they use the wild type antibody or either of those two mutant antibodies that I told you were mutated in the thighs or the shins. And the shins one is interesting because that's the one that affects the C1 binding, this complement protein. And so they pursue that further. And they show that if they use the wild type antibody, but now instead of using normal serum, they use serum that lacks the C1 protein, then they don't get neutralization. So that's starting to support their idea that this C1 is involved in this neutralization. And so somehow complement is involved in this anti-adenovirus response. They do some quantitation and they look at uh, how many of the antibodies need to be bound to the virus, either for TWIM21 or for this complement effect. Um, and they also then look at whether any downstream complement proteins are important, like C2 or C3, and those are not important, but they find that C4, the one that Brianne just told you, is one of these ones that can really start the sticking process, um, that that's uh, important. And so, go ahead. One, one other thing is that uh, I, I always have to remind people that uh, C4 actually happens pretty early. It's almost like whoever made this up couldn't count. Um, and so it usually goes C1, C4, C2, C3. Um, so they found all the ones that happen after C4 didn't matter, but C4 and things that happen before it did matter. They were named so, based on when they were discovered. That's Yes, the I know. <laughs> uh, so there's a, there's a cleavage of C4 that makes it sticky, right? Mm -hmm. Is, and it, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And does C one actually catalyze? I'm 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 a I'm uh, I'm a novice here. Does C one actually catalyze that cleavage? A C one R S does. Okay, so some factor that's associated with C one. Yes. Okay. So what so, so what do we got so far? Um, we have the hint that C one is involved and that C four is involved, and so now they're going to try and show. Uh, the title of this next section is Activation of Complement Cascade Results in C4B Being Deposited on the Adenovirus Capsid. So this is C1 is involved in, uh, in a, in a uh, trim independent fashion, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, so we already knew that uh, trim was hanging out waiting for antibody coated adenovirus to show up and trash it. Now what we're finding out is that even if you don't have trim, if you've got antibody-coated mm -hmm. uh, uh, adenovirus, C1 can be associated can can assist in trashing that as well. Okay. Right. So it's almost right. like we got two potential things going on: either trim or C1, and the notion that C1 itself could be involved in this—that's novel. Right. Yeah. Okay. And they don't have to be mutually exclusive. We could have okay. C1 yeah. and trim complement. Right. But they, in fact, but they in or, for the purposes of this, to assess the relative functions, they do segregate them. Correct. Correct. So um, there was some evidence, I think, from some human uh, biology that uh, you can find more C4B in certain kinds of situations uh, infections, perhaps. I don't remember that part. But basically, what they do is they take adenovirus and their specific antibody, 
and the normal human serum and find that they generate 4B and that increases over time and it's dependent on the C1. So again, Brianne told us that you have, go from C1 to C4 and so they're seeing that that that's what's happening in the presence of this adenovirus and its antibody. And that's and a cleavage. So you start out with C4, which is big, and C4B and C4B prime, which are smaller, and they have gels that show this, and they're absolutely striking. Right. So, so we make C4 into C4A and C4B, and C4B is the one that sticks to things. Okay. Right. And so they had two hypotheses that uh, – before we, I mean, we're just going to jump ahead and tell you that C4B is what's binding to the capsid. But <laughs> before they know that, they entertain the possibility that maybe it's the C4A product that's acting on the target cells, making them less permissive to adenovirus. And so the way they look at this was by making two viruses, an AD5M cherry, which will be red, and AD5 green fluorescent protein that'll be green. And they take the red virus, the AD5 cherry, they incubate it with the antibody and the normal human serum, which provides the complement, and they get, they do that so that they can get C4A and C4B. And then they add that to their cells, and after that, then they add the green fluorescent protein adenovirus. So if the effect was 4A working on those target HeLa cells, then the um, you would expect equal amounts of the red and green virus to be neutralized. But if the effect is not 4A acting on the target cells, but rather 4B acting specifically only on that red M cherry virus, then you would expect only neutralization of that virus. And that's what they saw. So that's their first evidence that the 4B is associating with the adenovirus virion. That's really so, a cool experiment. Yeah, it's it cool. I really like that yeah. experiment. Yeah. And then they do a couple of other sort of uh, rigor adding experiments, uh, in my opinion. They um, show that they can detect uh, high molecular weight products that contain C4, and they do that by Western blot. And then they also do this gradient analysis. So once again, they take the virus plus the antibody plus the normal human serum that gives them complement, and then they spin that on a sucrose gradient so that they'll purify away kind of free proteins from proteins that are associated with the virus capsid. And when they do that, they can see the uh, C1, or it must be C4, mm -hmm. I, I didn't write down, C4 protein associated C4. With, the, um, with the virus in that case. And they only see that if they have C1 there, again, implying that you first have to have C1 leading to the C4 cleavage. This is a style of science that I really like, where to prove a point, <laughs> you use like three or four or five really different approaches that mm -hmm. come to the same conclusion so that when you're done, it's just undeniable. Well, that's what Kathy said. That's rigor. That's what the yeah. NIH wants rigor. us yeah. to do more right. and more now. <laughs> right. <laughs> Different right. ways to show the same result, right? Right. Yeah. It's fine. Right. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. So then the next thing they want to know is what what step is the C4B binding to the virion? What step is it affecting? So this is where I would refer you back to the Erzgraber TWIV 523 virology in Zurich, where he just gave this beautiful explanation of adenovirus entry and all the way to the nucleus. And so the first thing that happens is the attachment. And they look at whether having complement present affects attachment. And the answer is no. Uh, they did this in a rigorous three ways. They looked at <laughs> the copy number associated with cells by PCR. They looked by Western blot. And they looked by flow cytometry. And so... Uh, there's a little bit of a side here that they didn't pursue, but it's probably someone's whole new dissertation project. But <laughs> in the in the presence of C1, the virus attachment becomes less dependent on CAR, the adenovirus receptor, indicating that somehow this complement C1 may mediate binding to another receptor. Mm. And that's all they say about that, but stay tuned for some future work on that. 
Okay, so the next thing after the virus attaches is it has to get in. And adenovirus, um, you know, so it, it binds with this car uh, receptor, and then entry is mediated by uh, RGD, three amino acids on the penton base interacting with integrins. And so they look simply with a time course to track viral entry. And viral entry doesn't seem to be affected with and without complement. So they show that at 30 minutes, they have a certain number of viral genomes associated with the cells. And 90 minutes later, they have the same number of viral genomes associated with the cells. So they assume that the virions were internalized and weren't just disattached and shed. Then they're going to look at the next three steps that are really cool and uh, what Rich was alluding to earlier. So there's disassembly of the virus, escape from the endosome, and entry into the cytosol. And I didn't quite say it right. There's disassembly of in two steps. The fiber is getting pulled out, and then this internal protein P6 getting exposed. So those are two steps. And then the escape from the endosome and entry into the cytosol. So this is something that um, this Urza's work, and and I think he talked about it. But So the virus binds to this receptor car, and the, the car molecule drifts on the cell surface. But the other part of the virus, the penton base, binds to the integrins, and that is fixed. So the car kind of drifting and the penton base staying fixed kind of rips the virus apart and kind of rips out the fiber proteins. In the endosome? Let's or see. is that on yeah. the surface? It says here on the plasma membrane. Yeah. Oh, on the, yeah, on the, on the, pla- on the surface. Yeah. So right. this is before endocytosis. Okay. Right, right. So, um, so that disassembly step uh, is the first one that, that they're going to look at. And basically you look at that by looking whether the fiber gets shed. And... You don't just ha- you can induce that same kind of uh, fiber disassembly by heating the virus, and so they simply take Ad5 virus, heat it to 49 degrees, and if you have a wild type situation, the fiber and the penton base dissociate, and you can detect that on a Western blot. But if you have the virus and the specific antibody to the virus and complement C1 or C1 plus C4, then you don't get that dissociation. So that's the first evidence that somehow this C4 binding is messing up this disassembly and downstream steps. So it's such a wonderfully simple experiment, right? Yeah. It's great. Yeah. It tells you so much. And look what happens. Yes. (laughs) It's great. So then they look at the next step, which is this uh, protein 6. So protein 6 is uh, sort of hidden. And then when the uh, virus starts to get uh, pulled apart, the fibers come out, um, P6 gets exposed. And this is really cool work by uh, Chris Wietoff, showed that this thing uh, is responsible for the endosomal lysis. There's all this biophysics of membrane curvature and stuff that... Uh, is involved. But basically, what they show is that in the presence of complement, you don't get the endosomal lysis. I'm not looking at my figures at the moment, so I can't remember quite what uh, what technique they used to... Pr- These oh, are a bunch of Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. That's right. So they just look for, um, yeah, how much of this... Uh, yeah, how much of the P6 exposure there is. And the next step to show that the endosomes get lysed, you can look at this other protein, um, uh, galactin. Galactin. Yeah. 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 And they show that uh, the treatment with the complement changes the galactin uh, pattern. And so that shows that not only is the complement blocking P6 getting exposed, but it's blocking the endosome from getting lysed. I have to point out that they say, we observed nice puncta formation. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that cute? They use nice. Yes. I hardly see yeah. it. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Oh, oh, just as a total. They are pretty nice. As, as, a, <laughs> as a total aside, back early in the introduction, they use, the, they talk about defects to C4 may have a knock-on effect on yes. C3. Mm. I looked up knock-on and the only thing, 
I don't have an OED. I don't have the Oxford English Dictionary. So maybe knock on is in there, but I couldn't find what they meant by oh, knock on. So. Thank goodness I wasn't the only one who didn't know what that was. <laughs> yeah, I looked a lot of places. Okay. Anyway, so back on this. So they've shown now that treating with complement blocks the disassembly, blocks P6 from getting exposed, and blocks the uh, endosomes from lysing. And so then they also look to see, well, if that's the case, then you would expect to see less virus in the cytosol. And they look, uh, again, by immunofluorescence, and they see less virus getting to the cytoplasm. And then they say, and if that's the case, then you would also expect to see less virus getting to the nucleus and being around the, uh, on the nuclear membrane. And they show that that's the case. So again, all really nice, clear experiments that are just logical next steps. And then, uh, pretty soon... So, here they're summarize gonna, you know, here. So, summarize. So summarize. <laughs> yeah, you can do so, it. <laughs> uh, well, I'll try. Um, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm Dixon in this one, okay? So, uh, virus is bound by antibody, which then allows complement C1 to bind, and the C1 complex catalyzes the cleavage of C4, which deposits C4B on the surface. And that whole mess of stuff prevents the normal disassembly of the adenovirus capsid. Uh, it can still bind to the membrane and I assume still gets taken up, I think they show this, taken up in endosomes but there it's stuck because you need the capsid to disassemble in order to rupture the endosome and get the mm -hmm. virus into the cytosol. Right. Right. Okay. Got it right. And all that happens in the serum, right? Binding of antibody and complement before yeah. you get into the cell. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's sort of interesting because we don't usually think about C4 as being something that's going to really affect the pathogen. That's part of the top part of the complement mm -hmm. cascade that we never really think of as one of the, the, activation or the effector parts of this process. So we didn't know it had some function other than turning on the next thing downstream. So would, and you, say, again, would you call that an effector function? I would call that an effector function. And once again, this is only one of two possible fates for adenovirus that has been bound to antibody. Okay. Because if you have adenovirus bound to antibody, and taken up in an endosome, but has not complexed with C1, mm -hmm. then when mm -hmm. that uh, endosome ruptures, you got TRIM-21 waiting mm -hmm. uh, to uh, then trash that complex. So you got two possibilities for uh, intracellular processes to get rid of adenovirus uh, that's bound to antibody. Uh, okay, now they're going to look and see uh, how does this work uh, in vivo. And so can you uh, somehow block infection by including complement? And so they use a luciferase adenovirus and they infect wild type mice or mice that are knocked out for C4. And the details aren't uh, real thorough here, but they basically look at the liver uh, for luciferase activity. And they show that, for those of you who might be following along, we're now on figure six. And uh, if you have uh, the, the first part is figure A, where they just are uh, in the absence of antibody to adenovirus. Uh, they see the uh, same amount of luciferase activity in the liver. But if they include uh, this antibody 9CCD12 specific for adenovirus, then they get a reduction in the amount of infection um, with, the, with the wild type mice, but in the C4 knockout mice, then they get high levels of infection, showing that the antibody that then complexed with the complement um, wasn't able to interact with the C4 because there's no C4 in those mice. And so you get pretty good virus replication. So basically consistent with everything that went, up, went on before that we've already learned, 
Right. It looks like this whole thing is operative in a whole mouse in vivo. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much the, uh, we're on figure six, which is pretty much the last figure. But the last part of this last figure, they start to look at adenovirus uh, from a different perspective, not from the standpoint of trying to prevent infection. But if we want to use adenovirus as a gene therapy vector, one of the major problems is that there's such high seroprevalence. We all have antibodies to adenovirus. And if you want to give adenovirus as a gene therapy vector, the recipient is going to have an immune response to that virus. So they do some experiments. Um, and already they've done several that uh, I've kind of glossed over where they show that TRIM21 and this complement uh, mechanism are synergistic. Uh, so, as we said earlier, they're not mutually exclusive. In fact, they're synergistic. And in this gene therapy uh, angle, they also kind of show the same synergy. But what they're going to do is pre-coat the adenovirus, that's a, a adenovirus luciferase expressing virus, and they coat it with just the uh, FAB portion of the antibody. So, this is just like your arms and head and trunk of your antibody. They cut your legs <laughs> off. Isn't this legs just off. one arm by itself? Uh, the, yeah, the I guess fab? you're right. right. Yeah, yes, so this, this is, is just one of your arm, either your one right arm or your left arm. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. And so uh, with that antibody coating the virus, then that would presumably block a full-on antibody from interacting with the virus. The, the full-on antibody would have its legs and would interact with complement, but this thing can't interact with complement, and so it would be protective. And they show that uh, in some uh, pretty brief experiments, but they show that they do rescue the adenovirus infection in vitro and in vivo, so that this uh, might give some ways of making the gene therapy people happy where Every time I go to an adenovirus meeting, it's all this, how are we going to get around this high seroprevalence of adenovirus in the population? Can we use these rare human adenoviruses or animal adenoviruses or things like that? And so this is um, just another approach. That, this could actually uh, be uh, quite important. Yeah. The <laughs> idea that oh, you yeah. would take your gene therapy vector and uh, by coating it with uh, a, a fragment of antibody that can't react with tw trim 21 or with the complement system and mask the binding of the uh, uh, antibody in the patient, um, deliver it more effectively to cells where it can do its work. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. It's very cool. Mm -hmm. um, you have to use, I guess you have to use quite a bit of excess of that antibody, but it does work. And they, they also look at transgene expression besides virus replication, right? And that, that increases also. So that's, yep. that's remarkable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have a weird uh, mm. technical question that this is, you, you may want to edit this out <laughs> if it's too <laughs> weird. They use a hybrid antibody, this 9C12. They describe as a mouse human hybrid. So I assume that it was a monoclonal antibody made in mice. So the uh, antigen binding segments are, I presume, from the mouse. Uh, and although they don't describe it in detail, I would assume that a lot of the rest, including the FC region, is from human, so that the uh, uh, antibody would be effective uh, in human cells. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that makes sense in terms of the first five figures because we're doing experiments on human cells, but now they go into mice and they're using the same. Oh, it's the FAB fragment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So they don't care about the human part. No. Really? All they care about is coating it with this antibody. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. doesn't matter. I, I thought it was interesting. They point out in the discussion that this mechanism, the C4 mechanism is similar to defensins. Yes. Yes. That mm -hmm. is so cool. They bind the mm -hmm. capsid, right? And they stabilize the particle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So defensins are are produced by, you know, our genes. 
And so we have these two. I wonder if they have a common ancestor, the C4 and the defensins. That's the idea. They probably do. You know, they're both sort of innate immune proteins that are antimicrobial peptides. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. The other thing I thought was cool is they say uh, in people with uh, who can make antibodies, a gamma globulinemia, they're more susceptible to adenovirus infection. Uh, and so that makes sense because these mechanisms we've talked about today complement trim 21 dependent need antibody. But mm -hmm. they say there are no cases of fatal adeno infections in complement deficient patients. And so they wonder whether trim is taken over in that case, mm -hmm. protecting them. Mm -hmm. But they say we don't have anyone who's any known people deficient in trim 21. And that may be why you're, if you don't have trim, you're really <laughs> going to yeah. get uh, in yeah. trouble. Yeah. Yeah. So, nice job, Kathy. It was very nice. Oh, yeah, that was well, awesome. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> very good. I, I almost cried, Uncle, partway through because no, you were it, good. It I just great. knew there was a lot to okay. lot to cover. But I, yeah. well, this I think, was this uh, was a struggle for me. It's uh, really helpful. It gives the picture, which is really a novel function for C four, and that needs. Mm -hmm. And I sent this paper to my textbook co-authors this one. I said this has to go in the next edition. Mm -hmm. It has to go not only in the immunology chapter, but in the viral vector chapter because it's a way to. And maybe mm -hmm. improve, uh, as you said, delivering this vector. Yes. Once I get around to thinking about how I'm planning courses in the fall, I can think about putting it in my immunology course. Yeah, yeah. for sure. It's a very interesting thing. Now, I, Kathy, I had one thing to ask you, and this okay. is this is I don't quite understand. What is this business with Factor X shielding the virus from IgM? Do you know anything about that? Um, very little, and uh, there's there's more to it um, in terms of. Uh, these blood clotting factors and uh, reacting with adenovirus in human gene therapy and so forth. And I didn't have time to really go back and, and review that so, and sort so, that out. So factor X is a blood uh, clotting factor. And they say, you know, it, it coats the particle and it, it's known to shield it from IgM. But they say maybe it could also uh, be involved in uh, blocking C4 binding in some way, which they haven't looked at, but. Might be, right. Might be interesting right. to look at, right? So mm. trying to tie that together, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Very cool. So it just goes to show, as I said to Rich pre-show, you can always learn something new. <laughs> Here we have compliment, which people, ah, oh, yeah, compliment, yeah, yeah. And then you, start, you, you can still find new stuff. Yeah. Well, uh, I know a whole lot more about compliment right now than I did uh, 48 hours ago. This is great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. uh, this uh, will. I stopped teaching very much about complement in my course. There just isn't enough time, although it does get mentioned. But now this is a good way to show. Here is a cool way that complement works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very it's cool. Neat. So, uh, Bian, back on your butter thing. Um, so <laughs> I, I took a, 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 a two different Chinese cooking classes lately and the teacher told the same story both times but when you're mixing your ingredients you add your little bit of sesame oil at the end so it coats everything and, and keeps the flavors in and so forth and she tells this story then about this MacGyver episode about how there was some toxin or poison in the water but he coated himself with oil and was protected from it <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it's the Kind of the opposite of the butter. Yeah, I guess the so. way you're describing it. Hmm. So I had a story which I remembered it because of what you said, Brian. That you said the butter thing, right? How does compliment this work? The butter thing, and so it, it's just the idea that students just remember a little bit, but not the whole picture, right? Mm -hmm. yep. So I had a. So I I teach my students that uh, quarantine does not work for polio because only one percent of in fact, the people are paralyzed, the 99%. Others, they're shedding virus and they're fine. They're walking around. And in the heyday of polio in New York, the police used to go from apartment to apartment in the 20s and 30s looking for paralyzed kids and drag them out of the house to the parents' objection and put them in hospitals. And, you know, I said this was totally useless and disrupted the family and all that. And so I had on the exam explain why. It's not a good idea to quarantine for polio. And most people got it right. And one person said, because the police who come in and take the paralyzed children then spread the virus elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought it was cute because, you know, they 
kind of yeah. got it, but then it could they, be true. Then they put the police in there, right. <laughs> and that <laughs> cured. But you know, you remember certain things like the butter thing, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I I remember butter for many years. <laughs> I like that. And of course, you have to like butter, right? Yes, yes. All right, let's do a couple of email here. Anthony writes, this in particular about a MERS vaccine is important. I found in general the use of domesticated viruses as beasts of burden in vaccine production. Interesting. And then he writes, twiv long and prosper, which I really like. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's good. Good. So this is a paper, uh, some vaccine candidates uh, for MERS uh, coronaviruses and these are using other virus, and one of them is a, is a vaccinia virus, right? MVA. Mm-hmm. And so that's what he means by using viruses as beasts of burden. And of course, uh, these are vaccines where you would immunize camels mainly, because yep. that's uh, how we believe most of the infections are transmitted to humans. And it's so rare that you probably wouldn't immunize humans, except maybe people who work with camels. But then I'm not sure that would be a big enough population. Anyway, we've talked about this uh, idea of immunizing camels, but yes, it's a beast. The other one's a bird. chimp adenovirus, right, Kathy? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Domesticated viruses as beasts of burden. It's an interesting way to put it, right? All right, Kathy, can you take that next one? Sure. So this is from Patty. Yeah. Greetings from a viroid in the Twixiverse. <laughs> There's no need to report the weather as I live in New Jersey, and you've probably already covered that. In fact, Vincent, I was raised on your favorite barrier island. My parents bought our first house there shortly after the great storm of 1962, when among other ships, a Navy destroyer was washed ashore. And she's inserted a picture here. That's the house a pretty was- impressive picture. It's yeah. amazing. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's a huge Navy ship. Yeah. Um, the house was built in 1912, and I guess they thought if it had survived that long there, wasn't much it couldn't withstand, and they were right. The house has taken the worst nature could throw at it and is still standing strong and remains in the family. In further common ground, I have a sister who lived in Ann Arbor for a few years, though she has since returned to the island, and I am an ER nurse working in Camden, New Jersey, though not the same hospital as Dr. Alfred. Small world, A. Eh? I don't know who so Dr. Doctor, Doctor Alfred was a, is used to be a listener and he was on Twiv oh. once. Twiv, uh, what was it called? Virology 911, right? Because he's an ER doc. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> it's a long time okay. ago. I think it was before you, Kathy. <laughs> okay. Continuing. I'm an old fart looking forward to retirement, but I have never lost my interest in all things scientific. About 18 months ago, I gave in to the teasing of family and friends and sur- surrendered my flip phone for a smartphone. Now they tease me because I got a phablet, which has a 6.6-inch screen. But hey, it still fits in my pocket, and I can see the screen without my glasses. In truth, I got it for the tablet features more than the phone. I've not been disappointed. For years, I've been an avid Audible book listener, spending a considerable amount of money every month on Audible books, and often settling for subpar as the number of selections are much improved but still limited. When a co-worker introduced me to my first podcast, she opened up a whole new avenue of entertainment for me, and it wasn't long before I found the Twix universe. Now I listen for free, and I thank you and all the other podcasters for saving me so much money and improving the quality of my listening selections. I've caught up with all the Twix casts, except for Twib, and that will take a while because you've inspired me to watch the YouTube virus lectures, and that involves some studying, but I'm understanding more of your discussions. I promised myself I wasn't going to write to you until I caught up, but I found I can't wait. I have to weigh in on three matters. One, while watching one of your lectures, you mentioned that some viruses need to attach to two different surface proteins on a cell in order to gain entry. What happens if only one of the necessary proteins is present? Does the virus remain stuck there, waving uselessly in the intercellular environment until it is picked off by a macrophage? Or is it able to detach and move on to the next cell and so forth until it finds a cell that sports both proteins? Maybe we'll just stop there. I love the the vision, waving uselessly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Yeah. I, th- I think she's right. Yeah. I think yeah. she is right. It won't get in, yeah. Yeah, and, and they can attach or detach. Yep. Yeah, all of these binding, well, uh, uh, it, it's an overgeneralization, but binding interactions generally are in equilibrium. Mm-hmm. So you can, once you're bound, depending on the strength of the interaction, you don't necessarily have to stay there. You can detach. Two, I just have to weigh in with my thoughts on the question of whether a virus is alive or dead. 
If you are on a spaceship with a mission to find habitable planets for colonization that did not support any life, how would you classify a planet on which you discovered viruses? It seems to me that it is human nature to try to classify everything, and viruses will not be classified. We prefer to see everything as either black or white, and often don't settle for anything in between, which is where viruses seem determined to exist. In my opinion, they are no different than a seed or a spore. They just need the right environment to grow, and that environment provides them with the sustenance they need, just as seeds and spores need soil and water. They're just different, admittedly very different, but life evolves to fill every niche, and viruses have found a very exploitable one. Well, I'm not sure they're a seed or a spore, but you uh, you can keep studying, Patty. Yeah. And maybe you'll learn. <laughs> yeah. I, think well, but she, I mean, she says they're different, admittedly very different, right. but, mm-hmm. you know, so... I, I can see the analogy. Yeah, but if you add water to a virus, it's not going to do anything. And where you add water to seeds or spores, and you know they'll start. So they're right. Really, but different. all you need to add to a virus is a cell. Right. Is so you know. Well, that's why I say there there are two. It's a it's a life form with two phases: an inanimate phase, which is the virus, and the living phase, which is the infected cell. And I right. think that. But you're right. You we like to classify things and. In this case, just discussing whether something is living or not, I think, is useful because it makes you think about what are the characteristics, right? Mm-hmm. I'm going with I'm going with undead. I like undead. <laughs> <laughs> the next, you're going to say they're zombies, right? <laughs> Three. I'm not usually one to beat a dead horse, but I would like to bring up the issue regarding the sequencing of the Gila genome. When I first learned of it, I had a powerful visceral reaction. I'm a white female and have had a good life. I can't recall any experience of discrimination, so for the first time, I have an inkling of what it must be like. Henrietta's ancestors weren't asked if they wanted to leave their loved ones, their home, even their continent, and become slaves in some foreign land. They weren't asked if they wanted to live in poverty. They weren't asked if they wanted to be denied the rights and privileges that would have helped them rise above the poverty. Henrietta wasn't asked if she wanted to donate her body parts to science, and she certainly wasn't asked if she wanted her identity and consequently her family's name released to the public. It's been several years since I read the book, but I recall one of her female relatives, was it her daughter, was institutionalized, kept against the family's wishes, and experimented upon without her or her family's knowledge. Life-altering decisions have been made about the family without their consent for generations. As far as I know, there have been no apologies, no restitution, and no formal thank you. Now, here we are in the 21st century, and once again, a decision was made that deeply affects the family, and no one bothered to ask for their input. It's an intellectual and personal slap in the face, and totally disregards the emotional impact the announcement must have had upon the family. It amounts to saying they aren't intelligent enough or valued enough for their opinions, and needs to be reconsidered. Scientists are people first before they are scientists, and they have to take into consideration all the consequences of their actions before they act. No matter how hard we try, science will never be pure. It will always be affected by our humanness. All things considered, I think the family demonstrated considerable restraint and grace throughout the process. I'm sorry this was so long, but I'm really enjoying this opportunity to have an intellectual discussion of sorts, and I promise not to do this too often. Thanks so much for all you do. From Patty and the Beach Hounds. You can do it as often as you want. Yeah. 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 That's great. I agree with the with the HeLa cells. Yeah, they should not have just published that sequence because if my sequence were determined, it would certainly not be released and said this is Racaniello sequence because it's confidential medical information. So you know they ended up retracting it and doing things to keep it uh, secure. But uh, yeah, I agree with you on the sequence for sure. Mm-hmm. But I like the way you're talking about, you know, her ancestors weren't asked to be brought here, and that's all true, you know. And mm-hmm. I and, and I really mm-hmm. wish you sound like a nice person, Patty. I really wish people in this country would remember that and please not uh, express so much bias against people like like right. we do. It's just totally unfair. Rich, can you take Anthony's? Sure. Uh, if I can get back to it, I'm looking up beach hounds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Anthony writes. He gives a link to an article uh, that is entitled One Million Pounds of Pork Seized at New Jersey Port Over African Swine Fever Virus Concerns. And it's a very brief article that is really summarized in the in the headline that uh, there was a uh, federal authority say one million pounds of pork products allegedly smuggled from China. Can you imagine? Seized, seized at a New Jersey port. A million pounds? smuggled i mean yeah. 
It's incredible. They said it was hidden under uh, packages of noodles and laundry detergent. <laughs> oh my How do you gosh. smuggle a million pounds? Yeah. They said they broke it up into a few <laughs> shipments. <laughs> but first of all, next time I go to a, a restaurant and I eat a pork product, I'm going to wonder if it's contaminated, right? And why would you want to do this and not, oh my gosh, come on, people, just to make some money, you're going to smuggle stuff in, right? Heck yeah. Heck yeah. So uh, African swine fever, by the way, wouldn't hurt you, okay? Yeah. But it's uh, we talked about this a few episodes ago. Yeah, it's a right. highly infectious and lethal disease in pigs, and so the fear here is that, and there is African swine fever in China. The fear here is that the virus could get into the uh, U.S. Uh, pork industry and really uh, wreck havoc. Which, but we it, we that don't would know. Be but we don't know if the virus was in this pork. Right? No, we don't know. Right. And they say the meat was, quote, primarily cured. <laughs> Whatever that <laughs> What that mean? Yeah. Primarily? Does that mean? Yeah. It's like Facebook says, oh, we released 10 emails, and it turns out to be 100 million emails. <laughs> yeah. Primarily a few. <laughs> yeah. It's weird. Uh, and he adds, uh, if you put together a U.S. virus world tour for New Jersey, you might consider Fort Dix for the 1976 flu. Yeah, it's a good idea. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Good. That is a good idea. Oh, yeah, that would be fun. Brianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Wink writes, dear TWIV professors, in your recent introduction, you were considering how you might have acquired your viral upper respiratory infections, URIs. You first thought of inanimate surfaces in your environment. Yes, rhinovirus can survive for 24 hours on fomites. But if you want to take a guess with much better odds, think of the reservoir for these viruses in nature. Children. People with contact with young children get upper respiratory infections at least twice the rate of who do not. Hmm. Um, and this is from Wink in Atlanta. Um, and I can just say that um, <laughs> some of my closest friends have uh, small children, uh, three or under right now, um, and they have started getting sick far more often recently uh, that now their children are in daycare. Um, and it seems like whenever I hang out with their kids, I feel a little sick afterwards, too. Yeah, this is, this is for Dixon, who had a cold last week, and he said it was from a railing. But yeah, he his grandson often visits him, so maybe yeah. that's what yeah. It was. Yeah, I learned the hard way to not hold a baby with RSV. <laughs> oh, you shouldn't get it though, right? Uh, well, it turns out that if she's talk trying to tell you things and actually sneezes into your mouth, um, you do. Uh, let me just take the next two. Quickly, Justin writes, uh, he sends us a link to a Washington Post article, the anti-government ideas fueling anti-vaxxers, a pretty decent write-up on what's going on in New York at the moment. So as everyone knows, we've talked about measles outbreaks in Rockland County and in Brooklyn, largely in Orthodox Jewish communities where the leaders have shown uh, distrust of measles vaccines. So you know, their constituency follows them. And in Rockland County, they have attempted to prevent uh, unimmunized uh, people under 18 from being outside. And uh, in Brooklyn, the city health commissioner has said uh, you cannot not be not vaccinated. You have to be vaccinated. He, he issued a declaration. And this is, of course, being contested by some of the people who live there because they have a distrust of government. and They don't want to be told what to do. However, um I, I was on a law podcast this week, and um, this has very firm grounds in law. It, there, it is constitutional to require immunization to uh, execute public health measures, for sure. But uh, people, of course, don't like this, and um, uh, I, I suspect we haven't heard the last of it. It's probably eventually going to And, and go this, to court. Uh, this, this article is uh, very good in that it has a nice history. Yeah. Uh, going back to uh, the beginnings of the 20th century uh, on uh, the friction between or the the uh, problems with trying to enforce yeah. uh, vaccine policy. So it's, this is not a new problem. They say vaccination policies that target children are a necessary and effective strategy. Although compulsory vaccinations make a lot of sense, they risk compounding and entrenching the sentiment and fear of patients underlying the anti-vaccine movement. So we need to reckon with the root causes of the sentiment by having a broader conversation 
about when parents can and can't opt out of state policies affecting their children. Okay, I understand that a lot, but, you know, it's to protect everyone. Let me read the last one from Volker. Dear Vincent, just in case you have not seen Inglorious Bastards, I know you are not a movie person, I wanted to send you the following link to a scene where three Americans want to pretend to be Italians to deceive the Nazis, but the Nazi they meet is unfortunately perfectly fluent in English, French, and Italian, and he loves to pronounce Italian names like you do. Enjoy and don't take it as a criticism. <laughs> I have a clear German accent in all the languages I speak. By the way, so I don't take it at all as a criticism. I, I know that. I, I say everything with an Italian accent. <laughs> By the way, when in, in an Easter egg you gave your best, I'm pronouncing Koch, it was either Dixon or Rich. I don't remember who exactly who came closest. Go to the following page and press the speaker symbol. Best regards and thanks to you and the crew. So there's a page here where you can click it. And it's like something like Koch, right? Yeah, yeah. Koch. Yeah. Have it, have it. That, uh, yeah. that, that Easter egg was Koch. hilarious. Koch, yeah. <laughs> with, what, with all of us trying to say yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, so either you or Dixon got it right. Okay, thank you, Volker. I, I have no offense whatsoever. He actually had said, um, <laughs> don't read this if you are offended, but no problem. <laughs> I can, you can make fun of me. I just want you to get your vaccines, okay? That's the only thing that offends me. I'm going to read one more because it's pretty cool. It's timely. And this mm -hmm. is from Mark. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, this is great. I thought, why on earth is a Western blot on the cover of the Wall Street Journal when I first saw this? And this, of course, is the article on the uh, Mueller report. And they have taken every page and made a little thumbnail and made a big uh, picture of all the 448 pages. And of course, the redacted parts look like a Western. Make it look mm -hmm. like a Western blot. <laughs> yeah, the the New York Times has the same thing, and there's they have a whole dedicated section to it. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, I yeah. saw quite a few people talking about that on Twitter about uh, the Western blot that they saw. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Now, Mark works for a distributor, like a, a supermarket distributor. He's the chief operating officer, which is pretty important position so i want to know first of all how do you know about a um, western blot because you're a coo and maybe you have science background or maybe you remember some college courses and secondly how do you know about twiv i'm just curious let's do some picks of the week brianne what do you have for us all right i have an article from the washington post um there are similar articles in a few different uh, outlets right now. Um, it's about a paper that was published recently where doctors um, did some gene therapy on an immune disease, uh, SCID, which is the bubble boy disease. Um, and they used uh, a modified uh, lentivirus like HIV in order to actually do gene therapy and treat 10 patients um, with this bubble boy disease with great success. Um, and this is for X-linked skid, uh, a very common form of this disease, um, not one that has been treated by these types of therapies before. Um, and so uh, there have been quite a few stories about this particular uh, set of patients and the fact that this virus was used in gene therapy um, to fix this disease. Do you subscribe cool. to the post, Brianne? I don't subscribe to the post. I can't even see the article. It says you have to subscribe. No, it, it lets me see a few articles. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe I've looked at too many. You may have seen yeah, too many. I've, I've looked at too many also. And I used to have a free subscription that went with my local paper subscription, and then they just discontinued it without telling me. So mm. I have to decide if I want to subscribe to the post. Keep reading for $1. Yeah. There, I, there are similar articles in the New York Times, but yeah, I thought yeah, this yeah. one gave a little bit better description of the story. Yeah, yeah. I, I do subscribe to the Times because I, I want to support them. Um, I, I would I would support the Post also because I think uh, we need to keep the press going, right? Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> totally important. Rich, what do you have? Uh, this is a New York Times Magazine article that I ran across yesterday as I was preparing for TWIV, uh, titled, and this is a quote, I want what my male colleague has, and that will cost a few million dollars uh, by a freelance uh, science journalist named Mallory Pickett. Uh, and it's a, 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 what I, I found to be a engaging and revealing article uh, about uh, gender discrimination focused on a uh, situation at the 
uh, SOC Institute, but is generalizable to uh, other institutes uh, as well. And the SOC Institute has had some real problems. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's just crazy. I mean, for no reason at all, you know, the female faculty members don't get paid as, as much as the male. And and the, the kicker was that they had a female president, Liz Blackburn, for a while, who did nothing about it, right? So yeah. it's not even, it doesn't guarantee to fix things if you have a female president, which is crazy, right? You have to have the right one. Yeah. But this shouldn't exist. And, you know, it exists everywhere. I shouldn't say everywhere. I know it exists here for sure. And it's crazy. Yeah, it's a big problem. I don't get it. Well, this uh, uh, awareness is uh, part of what needs to be done to address it. And so this is an awareness erasing article. Yes, but hardly anyone in the U.S. reads the New York Times. Hardly yeah. anyone. Right. And that's part of the problem. They will listen to a lot of people listen to Fox News, but they will never cover a story like this. Right. And yeah. also the demographics are skewed toward the um, college educated and yeah. so forth. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kathy, what do you have? Well, I picked something that uh, came through the U of M news thing. It's a thing about preventing airborne disease with a device that's. Uh, got cold plasma built into it. It can kill 99.9% of airborne viruses. And so it's from the engineering department, uh, civil and environmental engineering at U of M. Uh, The first author on the primary paper is Shaw. And then the last two authors are Krista Wigginton and um, Dr. Clack, who's featured in the the very short video uh, about it. And, uh, but the, the primary article is in the Journal of Applied Physics D, uh, or Journal of Physics D, Applied Physics. And I thought, man, if the adenovirus stuff was hard, this is way over my head. But uh, two factors govern the potential for disease transmission of airborne pathogens such as viruses and bacteria, aerosol transport and aerosol infectivity. UV irradiation alone only addresses aerosol infectivity, and particle filtration only addresses aerosol transport. Transport, But this device uses non-thermal plasmas that can address both transport and infectivity. And they use uh, as their test virus MS2, the bacteriophage, and they start to describe non-equilibrium plasma or cold plasma. And that's all you need to know. But the video is really cool and shows them going out in the middle of winter to test this device on pig farms. <laughs> cool. And he name, says that name, it's so funny. Wow. The, the name of the video is filtering pig air. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Makes you want to listen to it. Yeah. And he says, you know, sort of expanding into the agricultural world has, has opened up new avenues for his research. So, All right. I, my pick uh, for this week is the Mueller report, which uh, I have not read, but I have gone through a little bit and it's pretty well written. You know, when you, uh, good lawyers sometimes can write well, so this is pretty well written. It's really interesting. Uh, just, you know, it's 400 and some pages. So uh, I, I think everyone needs to take a look at this, and I want to tell you the first sentence. Quote, the Russian government interfered in the 2016 presidential election in sweeping and systematic fashion. End quote. And I think, I know this is politics, but this is important for everyone to read, and I want you to you think, you know, our president stood in Helsinki not too long ago and accepted Putin's assurances that he didn't do anything. But it's quite clear from this report that he did, and um, you can draw your own conclusions from that. The Mueller report. You should read it because you paid for it. <laughs> your taxpayer dollars yeah. <laughs> paid for it. Mm-hmm. And I have an anti-pick. This is something that is not my pick. Tips for taking great photos of cherry blossoms. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't looked at this yet. <laughs> I would never recommend it, so it's an anti-pick. <laughs> All right, we have two listener picks. Uh, Steve writes, stories from the Trauma Bay vaccine myth busting. Um, this is a blog post. <clears throat> stories about, if you're, uh, let's see, if you're reading this, chances are you repeated an anti-vaccine myth or said you weren't vaccinating your children and someone referred you in an attempt to dispel that myth. If so, I hope you keep reading because, as you know, the issue is important. So this is an article that attempts 
to dispel uh, anti-vaccine myths. And it's quite extensive. It goes through lots of things, you know, autism, formaldehyde, etc. Dr. Zimmerman said vaccines cause autism. And, all right, so uh, Dr. Wakefield was exonerated. No. <laughs> so this is good if you want to point someone towards something, but it's very long. I don't know if they're going to read it. Every every myth is here. It's good. It's very nice. Excellent. Cyprian writes, Dear TWIV team, for, first an immense thank you for all that you do to make the TWIV show possible. I enjoy every episode. I'm continually grateful for your virology wisdom and enthusiastic science communication. I've often thought to write but was never able to put into words how much your show means to me, not only for the education I experience with every episode, but the camaraderie as well. Here's my listener pick. I saw this article in PLOS Computational Biology and immediately wanted to share it, so I thought of you guys. I think this is an important topic because the lab presents a unique work environment. Uh, the paper is 10 Simple Rules. Let me say that again. The paper is 10 Simple Rules Towards Healthier Research Labs by hmm. Fernando Maestra. Here's the link. And uh, I particularly like the quote in the introduction. It sums up a lot of it. Quote, we are all smart Distinguish Yourself by Being Kind by Charles Gordon. This is great. And that mm, is a yeah, great is. quote. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many people are still listening, but people, please be kind. It really goes a long way. Mm -hmm. Big thank you to, a big thank you to y'all, Cyprian Rosetto, <laughs> who is <laughs> professor at the University of Nevada, Reno. What a great name. Mm-hmm. Cyprian Rosetto. Okay, I've said it twice. That's TWIV 544. <laughs> you can find it on any podcast player on your phone or tablet and also at microbe.tv. But if you are listening on a phone or tablet, please subscribe so we know how many people are out there listening. You really like what we do, as I said earlier. Please consider supporting us. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Brianne Barker is over at Drew University on Twitter. She is Bioprof Barker. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be back this week. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Great job in the paper. Really nice. Thanks. Really nice summary. I like the cutting off the legs. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Brianne helped with that. <laughs> Rich Condit. Emeritus Professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Thanks to ASV and ASM for their support and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>